Hey, Stevie, it's great to see you and thank you for joining us. Can you share a little bit about what inspired your interest in aviation? And also, did you have a, a mentor who uh, inspired you when you were learning how to fly? Absolutely. Um, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, and my story is definitely not your conventional story these days. I don't think of how I got into aviation, but every story is unique. So here's mine. I, as a kid really had, I have no family history in aviation, didn't know anybody who was a pilot. And I also really had no exposure to aviation at all. I was actually afraid of flying as a kid because I had ear issues that made it very painful when I was very young. So for years I refused to even go on an airplane. So I was not anywhere nearby, airplanes, airports, pilots, anything like that. Then one day in high school, I think it was my sophomore or junior year, I was scrolling around on Instagram like a girl in sophomore or junior year of high school would do. And I was on my Instagram explore page and I saw a picture of a friend of a friend of a friend posing with a small airplane. I think it was a Cirrus looking back. And I think I did a double take because one, I did not realize that small planes existed at all. I don't know how I thought pilots trained, but it definitely was not like that. And I also had no idea that you could just go up and fly for fun. I thought pilots trained to do a job and that was it. And I really didn't even know that much about that side of things either. So that really stuck with me, that picture. And I ended up scrolling through this guy's page a little bit more and just seeing all of his adventures that he had gone on in this airplane. Around the same time, I had to start going on commercial flights for college visits and school trips. And every time I was on an airplane, I would look out the window and think, wow, I wish I was the one flying. So I was pretty dead set on going to engineering school. So I ended up going to University of Michigan for computer science engineering. But that thought of flying was always in the back of my head, just flying for fun. I never really considered it as a career until I had started, but it was always in the back of my head as something maybe I would do one summer or just during school. And one summer, I was fortunate enough to get an internship in the Ann Arbor area, so I had the money to go ahead and do my private flight training. So I googled Ann Arbor flight schools, I picked the one with the best website, and I texted my mom that I was going to go on a flight lesson, and she said, be safe, and the rest is history. Well, that's great. Uh, you know, the, we actually share uh, a common background in some ways. Uh, I was an engineering uh, student as well, and of course, flying has been uh, a part of my being uh, for decades now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that's really cool is to be able to have a career that involves doing something that you really enjoy that's a passion for you personally. What does flying actually mean to you? So flying is two main things to me. I think one, it is just an opportunity to always be learning. I did all of my ratings quite quickly. I went zero to CFI in about two years. So I started flying in June of 2018 and I got my CFI in January of 2020, right before coronavirus. Um, but you know, your learning never stops. There are endless opportunities to try new things and do new things in aviation. And I think that's what makes it so exciting is I'm, you know, I'm thinking about getting my multi-engine here in a few months. I've always dreamed of doing my seaplane, flying multi-engine seaplanes, trying, you know, different careers in aviation. And you can really learn something from every single flight that you go on, which I think is so incredible. There's not many fields where that exists like that in that nature. And the other thing that is so important to me about aviation is the community. I have not found anywhere another community that is just so supportive and large really, and just shares such a strong passion for one thing as the aviation community. Everybody that I have met, I mean, I've met like my best friends through aviation. I've met so many mentors and people who just, everybody wants to see you succeed, which I think is really special. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Lifelong learning and uh, the ability to be part of that community, I think is really, a, really a cool thing about flying. What, mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have for uh, anyone who wants to get involved in aviation, especially young women? Right. So I think the hardest thing is definitely getting started for anybody. It's getting past that hurdle that's standing in your way. In my case, and I think for many young women out there, that hurdle is really not knowing about aviation at all. I never had like a hatred for, you know, the job of aviation. I never was told, no, you can't do this. I just simply didn't know about it. And so in terms of like getting more women interested in aviation, I think that's the biggest hurdle that stands in our way is 
actually like exposing them at a young age to this industry. Another thing that I would say, especially coming from a background of no family history, don't be intimidated if you show up on the first day and everything sounds like a different language to you. I remember vividly asking my flight instructor what CFI stood for on probably the third or fourth lesson because I really had no idea. For everybody and especially for women, hold your head high. Don't let people walk on you. Don't let people tell you that because you don't know everything on the first day, you're not going to succeed. Um, and just be strong and be proud of yourself because you did the hardest step and that is starting. In aviation, you do get a lot of like bold people who see all of, you know, the pop culture and the movies of, you know, pilots and they're usually all men. So I think people are a little bit more bold to say, you can't do this because you're a girl and you just have to hold your head high and challenge them and say, yes, I can. Absolutely. No, I think that's great, great advice. It can be intimidating uh, because there, there's no shortage of acronyms uh, and initials for just about everything in aviation. And you just have to cut through that and, yep. uh, and, and, you know, come in, come into it, uh, as you said, with confidence and there are no stupid questions. You know, you've got to, you've got to be able to ask those questions. And I think that I've found over the years, if you approach it from a, a learning standpoint, uh, that your instructors and everything really want to import impart that knowledge uh, to you. In the interest of, of jargon and nomenclature, uh, November 59, 21, Charlie means something <laughs> to you. And uh, so I just wanted to ask you about what kind of airplane you fly and, and do you have uh, a favorite airplane? My current airplane that I fly and also my favorite airplane, I may be a little bit biased though, is my 1952 C-35 Bonanza, November 59021 Charlie. Um, commonly known as a V-tail Bonanza, mine is definitely on the older side. It is a C model. So they started with just straight 35 and then A, B, C, all the way through S, P, and V at the end. So it is, it's over three times my age and it's, it's definitely got its little vintage nuances and quirks, but it is my favorite thing to fly. It's just an all around great cross country machine and it's perfect for short hops to, you you know, go to breakfast with my friends or um, on longer trips as well. And I'm looking forward to taking it to some fly-ins this summer as well. Oh, that's great. No, it's a, it is a, a great airplane and uh, very distinctive, you know, with that V-tail uh, mm -hmm. out there, everybody knows uh, what a, uh, what a Bonanza looks like. So that's great. Um, can you share with us a story about a, uh, share a story with us about a, a safety challenge uh, that you were able to overcome thanks to your training and skills, decision making, or uh, you know, any challenges with weather, fuel, anything you'd like to share? So I'm um, I've never been in like a true, real like emergency situation or even like anything borderline, you know, close to that. Um, partly I think because of luck and partly because of my own personal minimums and training and maintenance standards and so on and so forth. Um, but I do use my training on every single flight that I go on. Um, you have to. And so rather than a story, I think I'd rather share something that I deal with on every single flight, particularly the long ones, that it's very specific to my airplane. Um, and that is fuel management. So I, as I mentioned, did all of my training in 152s and 172s, where the fuel system is relatively basic. And then I stepped up to this airplane, the Bonanza, where the fuel system is actually quite complicated. And it's complicated for a number of reasons. Um, so when I transitioned to this airplane, I did the um, Bonanza training, the BPPP training through the American Bonanza Society. And one of the things they emphasize on is fuel management. And they actually, this is actually a little outdated. They just redid this training, like I think a month ago. So the statistics are from the 90s. But one of the statistics they throw out is that 91% of engine failures in Bonanzas, reported engine failures in Bonanzas, are due to fuel issues, namely fuel starvation. So exhaustion is where you run out of fuel completely. Starvation is where you run out of fuel in one tank, but you still have fuel on board. You just didn't know it. Right. Um, and this is a big issue with Bonanzas because of just how complicated the fuel system is. So for example, Cessna 172, you can put the fuel selector on both tanks and you can view the fuel level in both of those tanks simultaneously. There's two fuel gauges. Um, you can switch between the left and the right, but you have the option to just set on both. And the fuel tanks are both at the same um, like distance on, they're at the same like CG point. So um, you, you, know, you don't have to worry about the CG shifting when you use the fuel back and forth. 
Um, the Bonanza, on the other hand, there's a wide variety of different fuel configurations, but mine has three tanks. So I have two tanks, one in each wing, and then one in the back in the baggage compartment. Um, so the first nuance here is that there is not a both option. You have to switch between left aux or right, which it exists in pipers. It's not unheard of, manageable. The second thing is that there's only one fuel gauge and you have to toggle which fuel tank you're actually viewing the level for. So this can cause confusion if you think you're viewing, you know, the level in the left tank, but you're really viewing the fuel level in the aux tank. So you could accidentally run that left tank dry. Um, another nuance is that the aux tank is, again, like I mentioned, in the back of the plane. So if you don't burn the fuel in the correct order, you could end up with a very aft CG in flight. Mm -hmm. You could take off just fine, or you know you have to be careful to not put too much fuel in there to begin with. But if you burn the fuel in the incorrect order, you could end up with a lot of fuel in your back tank, not a lot, a lot in like your left and right wings, and you could land with an aft CG, which is not ideal. <laughs> And the last and most complicated thing about this fuel system, I think, is that um, it doesn't like transfer uniformly between the three tanks. So for example, let's say I'm in cruise and I'm at 23 inches manifold pressure, 2300 RPM, I'm burning probably 12 gallons an hour out of my left tank. If I switch to my right tank or my aux tank, I'm still burning 12 gallons an hour, but there's about two to three gallons an hour that are transferred back into the left tank. So if you don't account for that, not only could you overfill the left tank on accident if you don't burn up enough, enough space out of the left tank, but you could run out of fuel in your ox tank, for example, if you're not accounting for that extra two to three gallons. So whenever I go fly, whether it's a short flight, a long flight, a flight by myself with friends in the back, you have to be accounting for all of these things. I have to, in advance, plan out when I'm going to switch tanks, the strategy I'm going to use so that I don't go out of my CG limits. And then I have to write down times that I switch and keep track of where my fuel is at any given time in case of an emergency. So really, it, it's quite complicated. And I think stepping up from a um, like a very basic aircraft, it can be hazardous. And it's something that you have to consciously pay attention to. Absolutely. No, you got to have a plan. Got to have a plan. And yeah, that's always, always going to happen. And you, there's a potential to be distracted. So you got to come back to that plan and, and make sure that, uh, that you take the action at the uh, appropriate time. And uh, just for our, our viewers here, CG is center of gravity. You know, that's another one of those uh, kind of uh, abbreviations that we use um, in aviation. But uh, it's, a, it's very important for the uh, handling qualities uh, of the aircraft to make sure that your uh, CG stays within, within limits. So, Stevie, finally, as the country and the world has gone through uh, the pandemic, there have been impacts on aviation. Um, you know, what has the last year of flying during the pandemic um, taught you? So I mentioned this a couple of times before, but I did all of my training quite fast. So from June 2018 to coronavirus, I was flying upwards of 200 hours a year and I was flying quite often, like at least once a week, usually a couple of times a week for multiple hours. Then when the pandemic hit, my flying club shut down and I didn't yet have my airplane. So I had no way to fly like many people across the country. And on every check ride that I've gone on, I've been asked about the difference between currency and proficiency and how important that difference is. And the pandemic definitely taught me why we go over that and why it's important. There is no way that I would have hopped in a plane after two months of not flying by myself without an instructor. And I think it's extremely important to set personal minimums, not just for weather, not just for things like that, but for how long you can go without flying before you will hop in a plane by yourself and feel safe. Um, so I think being forced into not flying taught me how important currency versus proficiency is. And honestly, how scary it is that there are people that will hop in an airplane after not flying for that long, because I felt super uneasy at the thought of doing that myself. So no, you know, you can't take these things for granted. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, that's great. Great perspective, and it's really impressive that you have uh, you've been you've had the uh, the awareness to be able to understand the the distinction uh, mm -hmm. here, you know, this early in your in your flying experience. So, well, thank you for joining us. We look forward to uh, to seeing your continued success. Congratulations on all of your accomplishments up to this point, uh, getting to your commercial and and uh, and CFI, and uh, you know having your uh, you know your airplane and all the experiences that you've already had 
even within your first few years is extremely impressive. So, uh, you know, I'll certainly be watching your progress and uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you uh, at an industry event here, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. This was great. I'm so excited that I got to do this. So awesome. Thank you for being with us.